So I was born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland. And uh, if you fast forward to my later education, I did both my degrees at University of Strathclyde training as a chemist. And for the longest time, my career path has, has remained on that trajectory. I have trained and climbed the ladder as an academic scientist, becoming a, a postdoc at Edinburgh, um, starting my independent career later at Strathclyde with appointments at Bristol in between uh, and working between departments and university as well. So it's always been a track to academic path that I've been on. And it's in the last three or four years that that has begun to change or at least broaden quite notably, where uh, first ventured into the world of entrepreneurship in 2018 to start a safety culture and accident readiness company called Presite Safety, which had emerged out of some research that my team was doing at Strathclyde, but also out of some personal circumstance to tell the story of my dad who had been involved in an accident. So that was my first uh, uh, adventure in entrepreneurship. But since then, and with that first taste of entrepreneurship, that's broadened further. So I'm currently working on a more solopreneur adventure at the moment to write my first book. Much has been said about feeling like an imposter, feeling like a fraud, feeling like you don't belong in your workplace and that someone is one day going to find you out and chuck you out of the place. In more recent years, I've been more public about my own experiences with the imposter phenomenon, as we would call it, and indeed more public about some of the research that I've uh, tried to bring together in that field to understand the imposter phenomenon more and why it is that so many of us feel that way. But the story doesn't begin there. The story begins about five years before any of the research started. It started when I was moving from my PhD position, University of Strathclyde, to my first postdoctoral position at the University of Edinburgh. Now, there is a specific set of details there about where I started and where I was going. But what matters for anyone listening to this is that I started off in one professional set of circumstances with a close-knit team, people who I'd become intimately familiar with, knew how they ticked, knew how they worked with me, knew what we were all doing. It became comfortable. Moving from my PhD to my postdoc was the first time that I had moved to a new team with new people a new set of projects, new set of circumstances, and far more unknowns as to where all of these people had come from in this new team. And at that time, with that first large professional move in my career, it was the real first instance that I had ample excuse to compare myself to others in the room to look at my credentials, my papers, my citations, and weigh those up against other people that I was working with. But not just weigh them up against other people I was working with, but move very swiftly towards a state of panic where I felt that everything that they did was better than what I had achieved. Everything that they had managed to put out in the world was higher ranking than mine. And moving on from that, leading to the outcome of thinking, there's one day very soon that one of these people in this new team that I'm working in is going to point the finger at me and say, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You're a complete and utter fraud. Get out of the room. You don't belong in this team. Consider the story of your career and where and when this might first have happened to you and where and when it continues to pop up. Being able to document that can be really powerful. And for me, the first realization, as it may be for many others, is that moving from one job to another can be a real triggering moment for that. From my perspective, I grew up in a family with two younger brothers I, like many of those we've now come across in 
our research on the imposter phenomenon was the first person to go to university straight out of school. The first person to have that opportunity to go to university straight out of school. And therefore, as exciting as that is from a family perspective, that can also breed the related pressure of being the smart one, someone smart enough to go to university. All of that family related circumstances, all well meaning, unconsciously, subconsciously even, it can leave you with the labels of how you assume you have to be. And most personally, where that came forward for me is with that set of circumstances, being labelled the smart one, going to university, having the opportunity to do that, has always made me feel like I need to be the smartest person in the room. I am deeply insecure about being in a room where there's people who are further ahead than me, no more than me. That's my experience of where the imposter phenomenon comes from. It isn't the only place that imposter experiences come from, however. And another one, the only one I'll mention for now, relates very much to those moving to different areas within academia or moving to a different level of your training. For instance, when many of us go from high school days to university for the first time or from undergraduate to postgraduate education, that's more examples of moving from one professional situation to another. And related to the imposter phenomenon is a far less spoken about phenomenon, which is deeply linked to imposter experiences. And that is the big fish little pond effect, which looks at not simply how someone might feel like an imposter or a fraud or someone about to be thrown out of their workplace or having the feeling of that. The big fish little pond effect looks at the case where someone's academic self-concept, how they feel about their academic performance can actually be made worse just by the surrounding that they're in. Regardless of what the truth of the matter is, that person could be an absolute rock star, but if they're at a university or place with that are, is in a higher league table, where there's perhaps a culture of higher expectations, then that can lead someone to feel like their performance is second rate, even if that's not the case. And furthermore, even if teachers or mentors say the exact opposite, the more challenging, the more fierce an environment, the more that can lead someone to think that their academic worth is lower. And that cuts across gender, that cuts across socioeconomic boundaries, it's a very general phenomenon that spoke about in more specific terms than the imposter experience, but it's a very particular instance of where feeling like an imposter can come from. And it's probably the one most closely related to working your way through an academic education. So inevitably, whenever you talk about the imposter phenomenon, where it comes from, how it manifests itself, what impact it can have on you, the inevitable question is, how do I deal with it? How do I get rid of it? How do I overcome it? And in that one question, from my experience of trying to come to terms with it myself and later experience of running a research program on the imposter phenomenon, asking the question of how to overcome it is not only the most commonly asked question, it's the most poorly framed question. And by that, I mean, Who's to say that any of us ever overcome it? Who's to say that's the right way to look at it at all? And indeed, you'll see many instances of, of books and articles where the claim is to overcome imposter experiences, to cure it, to smash it, to get rid of it. All of those terms are provocative and, and may lead to more attention being thrown at the content underneath such provocative titles, but it fails to get at the ground truth, which is what you're trying to do with imposter experiences is to manage them, to manage them so that 
when you take those risks as your career progresses, as you learn to walk into the unknown, you're ready for the fact that each one of those new instances and new experiences could throw up something that your brain can't predict, might throw up an experience, something scary that you've never come across before and that you have no training and you can't possibly be ready for. If you go into that thinking that you've already overcome the imposter experience, then you're setting yourself up for the disappointment for it to come back in a new form because you're in a situation that is entirely new and unlike anything that you've prepared for before. One other way that I've come to manage that fear myself and in my book on the imposter phenomenon, You Are Not a Fraud, I've dedicated an entire chapter to looking at rejection and managing failure. The fear of failure is real in the sense that so many people feel it. But it's not real to the extent that it's a physical being or monster that need cloud everything that you do. Back in those early PhD and postdoc days, when I was moving from one position to another, it was also around the same time that I was trying to put the feelers out with academic fellowships and put together proposals to take my next more independent step in my career. But what I was not at all prepared for at that time was how I would respond to that first rejection email popping up in my inbox to say that, thanks for your application. It was part of a wide and large range of applications that came in. Yours wasn't good enough this time. Sorry, but you haven't been funded. When that first happened to me, I, I was far less mature about it. I wasn't expecting it. I somehow felt like I was more uh, more deserving of an interview than perhaps would have been the case at the time. In other words, I wasn't able to frame failure in such a way that it was actually an experiment. Back then when I was running out of the office with tears in my eyes and punching my pillow in my flat that I was living in at the time, I wasn't at all prepared for the failure, but even less prepared for seeing that as one stepping stone on the way to four, five, six more failures, but each one actually being an experiment on the way to that which would eventually become, an in inverted commas, successful. So to manage that fear of failure, to manage that resistance to wanting to try that new thing, that thing that might make you feel like an imposter, is to realize not only that you can fail, but more often than not, you will. You will fail en route to what you really want to succeed at. And the problem might simply be putting it in that word failure. And what I've realized over that period of going from not being able to handle rejection through to working with it, has been to use the word failure less often and use it either alongside or replace failure with the word experiment. Each failure can be viewed as an experiment, a way for you to find out, to get the data in that you need to craft the thing that will eventually become successful. And one way that I've looked at that to generalize it beyond my own experience, so in the chapter of my book that's dedicated to rejection, I've looked at stories in and well beyond academia of those whose main challenge has been to work with repeated rejection, to be told no time and time and time again, to eventually lead to the success that has been cemented in the history books, to give you that front page story that most people will know about, but don't really understand the story of how it got to there. And to give you one example, I worked with a, a genealogist to track the story of someone who had appeared in various blogs and parts of the literature, someone within the publishing world, an author from around the 1950s who went by the pen name Zora Rayburn. And there's a famous image of Zora out there in the world where it shows her plastering a wall in London with 200 plus rejection letters 
from when she tried to have her novels published. And that's more or less the extent of the story that you hear. But in working more closely to track the history of Zora, I found that not only should, did she try to persevere and continue on past the multiple rejections she received, that at one time she actually was successful. She got a publisher on board, but it happened to be amidst World War II, and that publisher got bombed out of existence, and she went back to square one. But still, she kept trying, and eventually, at the end of that story, Zora came up with a solution that wasn't within the traditional publishing world. But that story and others that I talk about in the same chapter are ways with which we can all realise that the person's set success that you see in front of you today is not what was in there yesterday. What we can often do when we compare ourselves to other people is to see the instantaneous nature of how they are now, not how they got to now. And indeed, that completely clouds your own view of yourself and where you are today versus where you were yesterday. And realizing that if you compare yourself today, being a better version than you were yesterday, that's the only game you can actually ever win. That comparison of you being here now and a slightly better version of yourself than you were yesterday, that's the game that you can always win. What you will never win is comparing yourself to someone else and forgetting that they have had a story to get to where they are. And more often than not, you completely fail to see all of those details. Most of us are still very much focused on how we present our successes rather than how we could possibly present our failures. In other words, we are in the professional world very much fixated on how we can decorate our CVs or resumes how we can add more bullet points to those CVs with more papers, more accolades, more competitions won, more grant income, more things that we feel others will look on positively when we want them to judge us. Such as that fixation on how to present successes and to work with what we think are the ultimate metrics of our performance being judged at, we can forget, just simply forget, that there is a story to be told, a richer story to be told, and all the failures, the near misses, the missed opportunities that happened in between each of those bullet points of success on our CVs. And although it's becoming more popular now, it's still arguably very rare to hear the terms CV and CV of failures within the same sentence. And the CV of failures is the powerful underutilized tool of our time with regards to managing failure and being able to celebrate it and learn from it to the best of everyone's potential. In my case, I learned about the CV of failures from uh, a scientist, Melanie Stefan, and an economist, Johannes Haushofer, who each in their own way were among the first in the scientific world, more broadly speaking, to present a PDF that was their CV of failures, all of the bullet points that don't make it into the CV and that we might often be ashamed to even air, let alone write down in written form for a PDF. But from that, I took inspiration to not just write my own CV of failures, but to publish it. And now I have my on my website, my CV, my main biography, the traditional thing that everyone is expecting, the bullet points of all the things that I think are successes, points to note, things to signal about my particular value. But the web page that's right next door, that's actually hyperlinked on my CV is the CV of failures. And in that, I list and try to maintain as best I can all of those bullet points of fellowships I've gone for, jobs I've gone for, competitions I've entered, papers I've got rejected, all of those things that don't ever appear on a CV but should be presented in order to bring the full picture, the real context of whatever appears on my CV. For anyone thinking about how to present 
the fullness of their story, their failures as well as successes. Consider this. You can print out your CV. You can flick through to three, 30 pages if you wish and tell that story of all the things that have gone right. But that will never, ever be as powerful as you being able to hold that CV in one hand and your CV of failures in the other. And what I would be willing to bet for most people is that your CV will always look like a pamphlet compared to the volumes of failures that you go through, personal, professional or otherwise, that make the CV on this side actually viable and, and worthy of being in existence at all. So I put mine out there to just add one more node to this growing signal of what a CV of failures actually is, to let others close to my world who would benefit from seeing that to take some motivation from it and realize that oh, we are all human. There are no superheroes in or beyond academia. Uh, everyone fails and everyone has these stories of repeated rejection that have at one time overshadowed the successes that are now shone in a spotlight for someone.